kept us all last week, and you brought us up to this point. We've had some ups and some downs, some mountains and some valleys, but God, you've been faithful. You've kept us, oh God, and we just want to praise you this morning for being a faithful God, a loving God, a kind God. And now, Lord, as we approach your word, I ask, oh God, that you would use your manservant one more time, that you would bless me and anoint me with power, with authority to proclaim your word. And Lord, as I preach to the audience of one and everybody else eavesdrops, oh God, I ask that you would allow me to be faithful to your word. Let it fall on fertile ground. Let some hear, oh God. Let all hear and be changed. Don't let us leave the same way we were when we came in this morning. But Lord, let us be able to rejoice in you, to magnify you, and to glorify you. Now, Lord, take your manservant. Hide me behind the cross, oh God. Don't let anything in me or about me get in the way of what you want to say and do this morning. But Lord Jesus, have your way, oh God, have your way. Holy Spirit, fill this place and fill your servant with power and with authority. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray this morning and we all say, amen. Amen. Good morning, Word First family. Hey, just give the choir another hand one more time because they really, wow. Brother Bradley, thank you so much. Sister April, Brother Long. <sighs> but Long, you sang that song just as good as I would. I mean, huh? I mean, man, we decided to let you go ahead and have it because I was going to sing it myself, but man, amen. There's a word from the Lord this morning. If you have your Bibles, if you would open them up to the book of Psalms, the book of Psalms, one of my favorite books of the Bible, the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms, Psalms 103 is where we're going to be reading from my text this morning, and I'm going to read from the New King James Version of the Bible, Psalms 103, 1 through 5. If you have it, say amen. If you don't, say wait for me. Amen. Wait for you. I heard you. If you're able to stand for the reading of the Word, please stand in reverence for God's Word as we read. Hear now the Word of the Lord. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from destruction, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies, who satisfies your mouth with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. May God add a blessing to the hearing of his word. Before you take your seat this morning, if you would, just raise your voice and shout the title to your neighbor. Just say, neighbor. neighbor. Oh, neighbor. Oh, neighbor. I come to get my praise on. That, that didn't sound like word first, so look to another neighbor. Look to another neighbor really quickly. Look to the, Sister God, don't look at your husband. Look somewhere else. Look somewhere else. Say, neighbor. Oh, neighbor. I don't know what you come to do, but I come to get my praise on. You may be seated in God's presence. Amen. I've come to get my praise on. Last week, Pastor Gunn started a series, or he finished up a series about your getting your desire or what you want to do you know, for God. And we came from the book of Acts 13. If you will, Acts 13 is one of my favorite portions of Scripture. I just love Acts 13, especially verse 2. It says that where Paul and Cyrus, they ministered to the Lord, the Holy Spirit said, separate unto me, Paul and Silas, for the work that I have called them. One of the things that we face in this pulpit or one of the things that we face in ministry is that when we talk to people, they normally come and say, what is it that God has for me to do? What is it that God wants me to do? Is it that he wants me to preach? 
preach? Is it that he wants me to be in the choir? Is it that he wants me to usher on the door? What is it that God wants me to do that I may serve him and serve him with my whole heart? Everybody has asked that question. And if you haven't asked that question, definitely see me after church. But all of us at some point in time, when you get serious with God, when you begin to take God seriously, when you begin to say that I want to serve, when you begin to say that I want to trust in God, we all ask that question. What is it that God wants me to do? And Acts 13, 2 says that as Paul and Silas, as they ministered unto the Lord, the Holy Spirit said, separate unto me, Paul and Silas, for the work that I have called them to do. What does that look like this morning? That's where I want to hang our hat this morning. What does it look like when you decide to minister unto the Lord? What does it look like when you make a declarative statement that you're going to take God seriously, that God is, in fact, the apple of your eye, that nothing that anybody says or does will sway you, that nothing anybody does or who's with you or who's not with you will change what you feel and what you think about God? You have made up in your mind that you have decided to trust in God. What does it look like to minister unto the Lord? What does it look like to make that declarative statement? Well, if you're there and you're following along with me, then if you come back to Psalms 103, chapter verse 1, Psalms 103, 1, we find out that there's a brother in the text. The brother in the text, he's asking the same question. He's at this space and place in his life where he has decided to take God seriously. He's decided that no matter what comes his way, come hell or high water, no matter who's with him or who's staying behind, no matter who agrees with it or who doesn't agree with it, He's made up in his mind that when he's in the presence of God, he says to himself in Psalms 103.1, bless the Lord, O my soul. He says, I will bless the Lord no matter what it looks like, no matter what the onlookers say, no matter what everybody in the church says, no matter what your pew partner thinks about you, what your pew partner says about you, he's made up in his mind, I will bless the Lord. I love that this morning. I love that this morning. Is there anybody in Word First this morning that's made up in your mind that you will bless the Lord? You don't care what your pew partner thinks. You don't care what nobody says about you. You've made up in your mind, I will bless the Lord. And notice what happens in this particular text of Scripture. We find that this brother, most scholars agree that this particular text, this particular psalm is written by a brother named David. Y'all know David. If you've been in church for one or two days, if you've been at Word First for more than one week, sooner or later, you have heard the word David. Y'all know who David is. David is that young brother that he used, he started out, he was a little shepherd boy that rose to the throne room of being king. David, you know who David is, that young brother, that sweet psalmist of Israel. Y'all know David, David, that brother that made sweet music for the Lord, that brother that was actually in the sheep, tending his father's sheep and everything. Y'all know David, that brother that hauled off and took a slingshot and one stone and cold cocked Goliath and made everything change in the nation of Israel. Y'all know David. David, that brother, that man that rose to the prominence of king by the Lord. David, that brother that got out there in the middle of all the people of God, and he dropped it like it was hot. He sea walked. He did the dang old thing. And as a consequence, his boo, his bae, his wife said, "Mm, look at the king out there just showing out for all the young maidens. You look at the king out there just dropping it like it's hot. Mm." And David told her, look here, babe, look here, boo, look here, honey. Let me tell you something. God looked over everybody in your family, and he chose me. And since he chose me, you can't tell me that I ain't got nothing to be thankful for. He looked over some prominent people in your family. He looked over some people with better education. He looked over some people with better experience, and he chose me. Is there anybody in Word First this morning that knows that you have what you have? You got what you got because God looked over some other folks, and he blessed you. Y'all know David, the king. And some things that's unique about the king is that when the king gives a command, when the king gives a decree, everybody has to listen to what the king says. Everybody has to do what the king says do. The king says jump, everybody else says preach my sermon then. 
The king gives the decree. The king gives the command. And when he gives that decree and when he gives that command, everybody got to follow along. Everybody got to do what the king says do. Well, look at the text, if you will. The king gives a decree. The king gives an order. The king gives a command. And the first thing you need to understand when you read the text closely is that the king, when he gives this command, he's not talking to his soldiers. He's not talking to the servants. He's not talking to the subordinates. No, the king is talking to his soul. Ooh. He's talking to himself. Look at what it says in point number one, and we can get in the rush on. There are four things that you need to see, four things from this text of Scripture that when you make up in your mind that you want to serve God, when you make up in your mind that you want to please God, that you want to worship God, David says there are four things that you should be able to see, four things that help guide us in Word First this morning, on the next week, the next few days, the next few months, years of our life, to help us make our decision, to make a declaration that we will serve the Lord. Number one, David says he's at un, un, he gives an unrelenting command, an unrelenting command, an unrelenting command, a command that says no matter what happens, ain't nobody going to change this. This is what I will do. I'm putting my foot down. I don't care what you say. I don't care what you think. This is what I will do. Have you ever put your foot down and told somebody what you ain't going to do and you meant that? You, put, have you, you know what? Young people put it like this. I put that on God. I put that on everything. That's right, everything. I put that on everything. You know what? That's my mind is made up. I won't be moved. I won't be deterred. I'm, my, fa my face is set toward this thing. It's an unrelenting, an unyielding command. This is what I will do. He says, bless the Lord, oh my soul. Watch what David does. He doesn't talk to subordinates. He doesn't talk to soldiers. He doesn't talk to people in the palace. He talks to himself. He says to himself, self, you got to bless the Lord. Self, you got to praise the Lord. Self, you got to make a commitment that you're going to serve God. He talks to himself. And maybe, just maybe, that's what we need to do at Word First this morning and every other time we step up in this sanctuary is talk to ourselves. You need to make a declaration, you make a declarative statement that you will serve the Lord, that you will praise the Lord and bless the Lord, oh my soul. I love that about David. I love that he states this with boldness. He says, I will bless the Lord. No matter what it looks like, no matter what comes my way, I made up in my mind that I will bless the Lord. He talks to himself. I love that this morning. Some of you thinking you're crazy when you talk to yourself. No, you ain't crazy when you talk to yourself. You're crazy when you say the wrong thing back to yourself. Because the truth be told, we all need to talk to ourselves every now and then. We all need to tell us something that we really need to hear every now and then. Sometimes you need to, be the, you need to talk your own self off the ledge. Sometimes you're the only person that's going to tell you something that you need to hear. Girl, you know, you sure look good today while you're looking in the mirror. Girl, you know, hey, you know what? Don't care what they say about you, but you're going to make it through this. You need to look yourself in the mirror and say, there is value in you. You need to look in the mirror and say, hey, you are worthy. You need to look in the mirror and say, you will get over this. You will get through this. You will get past this. This won't kill you. This won't take you out. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. You need to learn to talk to yourself. That's what David does. David finds himself in a space and in a place, and he commands himself, so bless the Lord. I love that this morning. When's the last time you commanded yourself? When's the last time you talked to yourself and said, so bless the Lord? I know you don't do it because sometimes even when the choir gets up here and they do their thing and they can leave you shouting and you can be clapping hands, but immediately when they sit down, you sit there like this. Don't think Amen. Don't say amen. Don't shout amen. And matter of fact, if you're in the church right now and you ain't say amen as of yet, then maybe you need to start talking to yourself this morning. <laughs> Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that's within me. I love that this morning. David talks to himself. 
And if you, you know what? I, I feel David. I feel David. Because here's the thing. Truth be told, there are many times I come into church. I come into sanctuary. Yes, indeed. The doctor, the preacher, the theologian comes into church. I don't feel like being bothered. I don't feel like saying amen. I don't feel like praising. I don't feel like putting my hands together. I don't care how good April sings. I don't care how much Brother Long throw it down. I just don't feel like it. But when I'm sitting over there, I say to myself, self, you need to praise the Lord. God's been too good to you for you not to praise the Lord. He's opened too many doors for you. He's opened too many doors for you. He's delivered you. He's held you together. He's kept your children. He's kept you in your right mind. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. You got to learn to talk to yourself. Talk to yourself. I talk to myself because there is no one to talk to. People ask me why, why I do what I do. I do what I do because of who he is and what he's done. Because he's been good to me, he allows me to do, to talk to myself. And somebody in church this morning, you need, you don't need the preacher to pump you up. You don't need the choir to pump you up. You just need to learn to talk to yourself. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. You know how good God has been to you. You know when that joker broke your heart, you should have been crazy somewhere, but some way God held your mind together. You know when they let you go from that job, you didn't know how you were going to make it, how you were going to get your bills paid, but some way, somehow, God showed up and he worked it out while you were still trying to figure it out. You need to learn to talk to yourself. You need to learn to talk to yourself. You need to learn to tell yourself something. You need to learn to tell yourself that God is still good. You need to learn to tell yourself that God still makes ways out of no way. Look at what he says. He said, bless the Lord, oh, my soul. My soul, my soul, my soul. That word in the Hebrew is that Hebrew word nephesh. Nefesh, that word nefesh simply means it is the breathing part of a person. It's that activation and that facilitation that causes the rest of an individual to move and be functional in your life. That nefesh in your life. Here it is. It's that breathing part. What it needs is that if you begin to speak to your soul, your soul will speak to the rest of you. If you tell your soul, soul, bless the Lord. And when you start talking to yourself, that breathing part will start talking to your hands. If you start talking to your soul, it'll start talking to your feet. If you start talking to your soul, it'll start talking to your mind. Bless the Lord, all my soul, and watch everything else follow up and follow through. There's an old preacher said one time that when you come into church, you should be tired when you leave church. Because when you come into church, you ought to leave it all on the field. You ought to leave it all on the line. When you come in up in here, you ought to be prepared. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I'm going to praise him. I came to worship him. I came to call upon him. I came to bless the Lord. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. If you get your soul right, Everything else will begin to follow and act right. If you talk to your soul right, your hands will begin to act right. If you talk to your soul right, your feet will start wanting to run around the sanctuary. If you talk to your soul right, your mind will want to praise him more. If you talk to your soul right, you got to learn to talk to yourself and pump yourself up because you come in the presence of a holy God. And since you're in the presence of a holy God, all you want to do, God, I just want to be where you are. God, I just want to tell you thank you. God, I just want you to know how much I need you. I just want you to know that without you, God, I would have been lost. Without you, God, I would have been towed up from the floor. Without you, God, I don't know where I would be right now. But since you're here and since you showed up and since you did some things for me, since you took care of me at 22, since you took care of me at 23, I know you're going to carry me in 24. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and all that's within me. If your soul starts blessing him, the rest of you will start blessing him. But not just that. He says, bless the Lord. Oh my, I told you last time I preached for you, that Hebrew word for bless is that word barak, barak. Say for every church, say barak. Say it with a little spit in your throat, barak. You got to say it like that. Barack, Barack simply means that you just bow down. When you think about how good God has been to you, 
tears start falling down your face. You just want to give him some praise because when it brings you to your knees, when you just begin to think, God has been so good to me. Oh, I can't tell it all. It just, when I begin to barack God, I just begin to praise God. I begin to thank God for the little things and for the big things, for the ways he's made, for the things he's done in my life. It makes me barack the Lord. It makes me bless the Lord because he did for me what I couldn't do for myself. Oh, bless the Lord. Oh, my soul. I want to barack the Lord. I want to tell him thank you. Have you ever been walking around your house and you had a flashback and when you had that flashback, tears began to stream down because you began to think, God, I just want to thank you. Oh, I used to tell my old church, tell our old church, if you can T-H-I-N-K, you can show enough T-H-A-N-K because when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me. My soul cries out, hallelujah, thank God for blessing me. When I have, can we just have a thank party really quickly? Can you think about yesterday some things that he's delivered you from? Can you think about yesterday some ways he's made for you? Can you think about how he took care of your kids? Can you think about how he blessed your spouse? Can you think about how he blessed your marriage? Can you think about how he blessed your health and blessed your body? Can you think back to how good God's been to you? That's why you were here right now this morning. Oh, you look mighty good this morning. That's why you ought to barack the Lord. Because when you look around, your neighbor might tell you, girl, you sure look good, Sister Gunn. You don't look like what you've been through. You sure look good, Sister Clay. You don't look like what you've been through. Girl, God has been good to you. Oh, oh, oh. Oh, I love it. My, my, my wife, my wife, my wife, uh, she'll pick a fight with me afterwards. But she's in her upper 40s, uh, uh, a few years from getting to 50. A few years to getting to 50. Um, every time she go to one, somebody at my daughter's school, they ask my daughter, girl, is that your mama? She said, yeah, that's my mama. And they be like, mm, she don't look like your mama. My wife told some, some sisters at a volleyball game how old she was, and they tell me, mm, girl, we thought you was our age. God has a way of preserving you. God has a way of keeping you. God has a way of blessing you. Well, you don't look like what you've been through. We serve a God that is able. He's able, I tell you. Ooh, I, that's kind of like, I look like what Jay-Z says a little bit. 30 is the new 20 and all that kind of stuff. No, it ain't the new 20. You just look the part. Because you serve a God that can redeem, redeem the time. You, you, you know what? My, my, my daughter didn't know how old, uh, you know, brother, uh, brother, but didn't know how old Sister Cynthia and was Sister Tracy and it was. She, and she's like, who is, uh, who's the brother that be ushering on the door, Daddy? I said, that's Brother Terry. She said, his wife is the lady that wear those hats and be dressing cute. I said, yeah, they don't look like it. They just look good every time. I said, I'm going to catch up Brother Terry. Daddy, let him have it. Let him have it. Meaning I can't mess with his suit game. <laughs> As Pastor said, when he talked about it last time, I just backed up. You don't look like what you've been through because you serve a God that holds you, that keeps you, that blesses you, and that ought to make you barack the Lord. All of you should be shouting in here because two years ago, COVID had your name on the list. But look at where you are right now. You had some friends, some family members that were called home, but God kept you. So friends or family members that ain't made it yet, but God held you? Barack the Lord. Not only, point number one, does he give you an unrelenting command, but number two, he gives you his unmerited compliments. Ooh, I like that, Pastor. You're going to like this right here. He gives you his unmerited commitments, his unmerited compliments. It's right there. If you still got your Bible open, if you still got your app unlocked, look right there. Psalms 103, verse 2. Look at what it says. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Ooh, somebody should have shouted right there. Let me give it to you one more time. Give it to you one more again. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all. All his benefits. 
Have you flipped over your life and seen all the benefits that God has blessed you with? He gives you at least six of them really quickly here. He says, number one, bless the Lord, oh my soul, for getting out all his benefits. Look at what he says right here. He says, number one, he, he who forgives all your iniquities. He who heals all your diseases. He who redeems your life from destruction. He who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. He who satisfies your mouth with good things. The Lord executes righteousness and judgment to those who are oppressed. Forget not all his benefits. He gave you six things that will make you ought to turn over the pew you sitting on. Six things that should make you stand up and chunk your pocketbook at me. Six things that ought to make you take your heels off and throw them at the sanctuary. Six things that ought to make you pull your hair out. Six things that ought to make you say, yes, Lord. Look at what he says in number one. He says, and who forgives all your iniquities. I love that. I'm sorry, Pastor, hold on. Pause, pump breaks on the sermon. If y'all can't shout right now, go ahead, rise up and head that way because that means you fronting in word first. Somebody front in word first. Here's why, and let me tell you, he who forgives all your iniquities. Oh, no, no, not just one. Not just two. But all your iniquities. Everybody in here has done some grimy stuff. Everybody in man, listen, uh, one, one preacher said, everybody in the sanctuary is a crook. You my wife, baby, watch your purse. Everybody in here is a crook. He says he forgives all our iniquities. Iniquities, let me break it down, let me help you. All your ratchetness, all your sins, all your dirt, all those hidden things that don't nobody know about but you and Jesus. He says he forgives all of that. And somebody needs to have a forgiveness praise party that God has the dirt on you and he still forgives you. Oh, most people hate on you with a rumor. But God loves you with the facts. I love it. I love it. But here's what we do. Here's what we do. Here's what we do in church, Pastor. Check this out. We have a tendency to measure ourselves against our fellow men. That, 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 that's what we do. God is not judging you based on the amount of sin. Well, hey, uh, I'm not as bad as Brother Akeem. And Brother Akeem ain't as bad as Brother Walter. God is not judging you based on the type of sin or the amount of sin. God is judging you based on the fact of sin. That when he looks at you, he knows that you're filled with sin. The first sin should have cut you off from the grace of God. Matter of fact, truth be told, some of us can't even remember our first sin. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'll wait. Y'all remember your first sin? Your first sin should have cut you off from the grace of God. But God says, even in the midst of your first sin, I loved you anyway. A little boy one day was playing at home and had home with his mom because he wasn't in school. And while he was playing at home, he was playing with a roach. He saw this roach on the floor and he was hiding it under a cup and playing with this roach. And his mama walked in and said, boy, kill that roach. That's nasty. I don't want to see you doing that. He says, but mama, I, I, I like this roach. She said, that's nasty. That's repulsive. And I argue with you that that's what God sees when he looks down at our sin. We are like roaches. We are just grimy. It makes you feel some type of way. And you, it, at first glance, your instinct is to kill it. But God says, I got grace on that person. Ah, roaches and rats are to garbage what demons are to sin. The more ratchet and wretchedness you have in your life, the more and the farther away you get from the glory of God. God says, in the midst of all of that mess, I love you anyway. My daughter, my daughter, my daughter, when she was younger and everything, me and my wife were at home, and this is when she was a baby, and she had to be changed. And my wife was sitting on the couch, and I was sitting on the couch, and she was crawling around, and the mess was just amorphous and in our nose and in our nostrils. And I looked at Tracy, and Tracy looked at me, and she said, well, somebody got to handle this mess. Well, you her mama. 
Somebody need to change her. Well, you her daddy, and sooner or later, the smell got so much, and it says somebody has got to deal with this mess. So I was like, okay, Tracy, I'll deal with it. I went up, picked my baby up, because that's my baby, my bundle, my pride and joy, my twin over there. And I go pick her up and put her on her changing table. And when I put her on her changing table, I still got on a suit from work. And in my suit, I have this pen, this pen. I love this pen. They gave it to me at work. and It was a $200 pen. And while I'm changing my baby and everything, I haul off and I threw the diaper down and the little thing and everything. And when I reached over to throw the diaper away, my pen <laughs> fell, in the, fell in the same thing. So now, I love this $200 pen, but it's falling, it's a mess. Like any person that's a little cocky, I want my pen. I love that pen. So I did what I had to do. I rolled up my sleeve, reached down in that mess, and grabbed my pen and washed it off. That's what your God did with you. You still think I'm talking about a pen? I'm talking about you. Then God, he reaches down in the mess, the zip pool of sin. He rolls up his sleeve and he pulls you out and washes you in the blood of Jesus. Somebody ought to have a praise party. Forgiveness is what he says for all our iniquities. But that's only one benefit. He not only forgives all our iniquities, the Bible says, and he heals. All your diseases. Oh, I love that this morning. He heals all your diseases. Somebody can testify that you're the recipient of God's healing power. Somebody can testify that some things the doctor gave up on, but God, God said not so. Some of you can testify that when you thought it was over with, God showed up and he said not so. Oh, I love this morning. We walked in and pastor came in and me and Sister Clay were over there talking to the pastor. And pastor said, hey, my mother, she's doing well. God shows up, and his bill blesses you with health and with healing, and God turns around, and he redeems the time. But, 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 let me be the first to say, all healing ain't physical healing. Some of you, God had to heal your heart. Some of you, God had to heal your mind. Some of you, God had to put you back together again because some of you were going through it. You were tore up from the flow up, and God showed up and said, not so. You thought that when they broke up with you, when boo-boo said bye-bye, that it was the end, that it was over. But God says, not so. Because you know why? God always has another. He has another boo, he has another bay, he has another job, he has another vision. He always has another for you. His healing, his healing for you. But not only that, number three, and I can get ready to get out here because we can't go through all of them, but number three, he redeems. Oh, I love that right there. Everybody should have shouted, he redeems you. He re the Bible says here, he says he redeems us. Ain't that a beautiful picture? Let me give you the picture of redemption. The picture of redemption looks like this, is that we were on a cliff headed for damnation and destruction on the edge of the cliff. And the picture looks like this. When you're in salvation, you are in like this, and this is where you are going to make that final step and fall off. God looks down from glory, seeing you about to fall off. He reaches down and snatches you out. He snatches you out of destruction, snatches you out of the jaws of hell to set you up on a high place, to set your feet on solid ground. He loves you so much, he redeems you. He buys you back. He keeps you from getting into something that's going to mess up the rest of your life. I, I, I was getting ready to preach, uh, preach a uh, Easter message, and when I was sitting in the office one time, I was preaching this Easter message, and like and most preachers do, uh, Pastor Gunner testify, if you're in an office with a window, all you do is look out the window and you start people watching. You watch who's coming into the sanctuary, and this particular Easter, a sister, a brother, and a baby get out the car. They pull in in a nice whip. They get out wearing all white. Remind you of Brother Terry now. <laughs> they are coordinated. The sister gets out. She's got on a white dress some hot pink pumps, a nice pink hat, some pink bracelets. She is stunning. But not to be outdone, the brother gets out on the other side, and he's got on a white suit. 
and a pink tie. He got a pink earring in his ear. He, they are coordinated. And not to be outdone in the back seat, little man gets out. He got on a white suit, some pink J's, with some white J's with some pink shoestrings in it, a pink shirt up under his little jacket, and they are coordinated. They are looking good for Easter Sunday. Nine, you on this Easter Sunday, it's raining outside a little bit. The mama gets out. Daddy grabs him by the hand. The baby gets out. And the baby, the little man, when he starts seeing all that water, that puddle, he says to himself, I need to go get in there. <laughs> so little man, when they all get together, he takes out running away from his mama and daddy. He sees a puddle, and that puddle must have been called in little man's name. So little man saw that puddle. He went over there. He began to jump up. And I'm in the, I'm in the church looking out the window going, Hey! He about to get into something. Daddy sees the baby check, catch out running. Daddy catches out behind him. And as soon as he jumps up to jump in that puddle, daddy reaches out and grabs him. Before he gets into something he can't get himself out of. And that's what God does to us. You are in a space and place. You done wretched up. And God reaches out and he snatches you back. He redeems you from the hand of the enemy. He holds you in the midst of everything you're going through. Not only do you have his unrelenting command, not only do you have his unmerited compliments, you have his unyielding character. I love this. If you look at the text right quick from verses 7 through 18, it talks about the mercy of God, the grace of God. It says that God is slow to anger. So all the things that you go through, the hell, the high water, the mistakes that you make, have you ever been in a space and place and you prayed to God, God, if you just let me get out of this one, I will never do that one again. Have you ever been with a one night stand, your old ex jump off and said, God, if you let me get out of this, I will never go back there again. And 30 minutes later, not next week, not next year. 30 minutes later, you planned it, you strategized about it, you plotted it. The only thing that saved you was when you called them, they didn't answer the phone. Oh, why? Because in the gospel of Kurt Carr, God blocked it. God blocked it. But you God's mercy, his mercy, his mercy, his mercy, his mercy. Is there anybody that can be thankful for the mercy of God, for the grace of God? His mercy blocks what should have happened to you to keep it from happening to you. His grace gives you what you don't deserve, but his mercy, it protects you. His mercy, the Bible says because of the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed. Because of everything that you've done, everything that you're thinking about doing, everything you're going to do when you leave this church today, God says it's because of his mercies that you are not consumed. He's long-suffering. He's patient. He's kind. He's good to you. His mercies, his, his unmerited character, his unyielding character. But not only that, so we can get up out of here really quickly. God, the Bible puts it like this. He shuts it down. David shuts it down the same way he opened it up, with his unrelenting command. Look at what David says in verse 19 through 22. He says, bless the Lord, all ye his angels. David gives a directive. He gives a direct command this time, and this time he ain't just talking to his soul. This time he says, bless the Lord, all ye his angels. Now, we know, we see this in Isaiah 6, what Isaiah said, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. But then he goes on to say he saw some seraphim, he saw some cherubim, and they were all calling out one to another. We call this call and response. When I say God is good, y'all always say, well, help me with this sermon then. And look at what happened. He says these angels are doing this call and response. They're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And every time they say holy, they are hoisting God. They are raising God up. And that's what you do when you're at word first. When you say holy, when you say thank you, you begin to hoist your God up. You begin to make your God bigger than your problems. 
He says, he says right here, he says, he says, all the angels praise the Lord. And ain't it funny that the angels praise the Lord and they ain't even been redeemed. So if the angels can praise him and you who have been redeemed, show sure enough ought to open your mouth and say thank you. You can't have gray hair and be quiet. You can't have gray hair and forget to thank God. You can't have gray hair and forget how good he's been to you. Somebody ought to thank God for his mercy this morning. Uh, but not only that, he says the angels praise him. And then he says, bless the Lord, all ye his hosts. This host is a picture of soldiers on the battlefield. They're on the battlefield fighting present tense. And they are shouting even though they ain't even won yet. That's the version, that's the vision, that's the portrait of where we are as believers. You need to be shouting while you're waiting on your victory. Shouting while you're waiting on your deliverance. Shouting knowing that it's on the way. Shouting knowing that God is still in control. Is there anybody in Word First this morning that's dealing with a battle, a battle on your home, a battle on your job, a battle with your kids? Shout now! And you know that God is still able. Don't wait till the battle is over. Shout now is what you need to be doing. But look at what he says. Not only that, he says, let all ye ministers praise the Lord. Let all ye ministers bless him. Ooh, you got some ministers in the house this morning? And I'm sorry, that means all y'all. That means all y'all. Because you ain't got this in your hand, don't mean you ain't a minister. Because you ain't behind the pulpit, don't mean you ain't a minister. You don't have to be in this space to say that you're a minister. Oh, no. He says, let the ministers praise him. Let the ministers bless him. I'm waiting on y'all to bless him. I have said it two times. He said you ought to be able to thank God for all he's done. Bless God for every blessing, for every valley that he's walked you through, for every mountain he's seen you over, for every victory he's carved out in your past. Somebody ought to bless the Lord. Let's go, Bradley. Won't he make a way for you? Won't he provide for you? Won't he fight your battles? Won't he make your enemies your footstool? Won't he dry your eyes? Won't he help you? Won't he take care of you? Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Somebody shout now. I don't know what you come to do, but I come to praise the Lord. Goodbye word first. May the Lord bless you mighty good, but I come to praise the Lord.